thank you to Lata Mani for initiating this. This might be my second lecture in Bangalore for the public, and I think the last one also she organized at the Max Mueller Bowen. I also want to thank um, Peking Duck for inviting me to Speaking Duck. Um, I also want to thank many, many people in the audience who I don't know personally, but I appreciate you coming and taking time to listen to this talk. Uh, the way that I've structured this talk is uh, I kind of was in many different minds because this is an ongoing project. Um, and I wasn't sure which way to present it. Was it to present it as a completed event or to present it as something that is an ongoing conversation? Um, and I, I decided to present it as an ongoing conversation, which means that <coughs> the first maybe half to three quarters of this lecture are actually about the exhibition. Um, and then maybe a third of the lecture or something a little bit less is more provocative and polemical. Uh, and it's because the questions have come to me in the process of working on this exhibition. OK. Um, so I will explain this title, Working Away from the Obligation to Solace, um, shortly. <coughs> but I want to just begin by talking about how I came to this project um, and what made me interested in this area. Uh, I am obviously um, a trained art historian. I did my PhD in late medieval ur urbanism on the site of Humpy. Uh, my first job was um, out of my PhD was as the editor of India's oldest independent arts publishing publication started in 1946. So the mandate for MARG was, um, in part, it started off as Modern Architects Research Group. But by 1947-48, it became MARG, the Sanskrit word for path, right? And in the meantime, J.R.D. Tata and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru had given Mulk Raj Anand, who was the editor, along with a very interesting group of people, including the Sri Lankan uh, Silanese at that time, but later Sri Lankan uh, architect Manette de Silva, and uh, Carl Kandalwala, and many other people who we identify as the sort of culture makers of modern India. So my first seven years were trying to cope with this history of legacy of modernism. And the mandate was, on the one hand, to debate important issues like Navi Mumbai. Uh, for example, uh, Gyan Prakash has recently done a book about the plan, the urban planning for uh, Navi Mumbai. Uh, things like Charles Correa's ideas about Indian urbanism, um, what to do with museums in modern India, uh, what, what to do with um, art education, all this sort of stuff, curriculum development. So that was one aspect of it. The other aspect of, of, of it, of course, is the crisis that every, I think, uh, English-educated Indian uh, political leader faced, especially the male political leader, uh, which is, how do you rule a country of people you have no idea about, right? So um, Jawaharlal Nehru says, for example, to Mulk, uh, go discover India just like he discovered India in his letters to his daughter, through his letters to his daughter. Uh, and of course, uh, Mulk dutifully did that. And the word that was used at that time was uh, make the future through discovering the past, you know, the idea that was used. Um, so in the process of this, I also became uh, great friends with Mulk Raj Anand's uh, designer, uh, Dolly Sayar, who was 78, and I had the very good fortune of um, meeting Mulk when he was 98. And I met him when he was reading Shahid Amin's Incident at Chori Chora. Uh, and he asked me to read it for him because at 98, he had energy for X amount of things and not for other things. So for reading, there were other people. For writing every day at 5 o'clock in the morning, there was his hand. So uh, I had these sort of experiences, which are, I think, very unique. I don't think if I, had, if I hadn't taken that kind of a job, 
I wouldn't have read like 700 pieces of writing at, in my time at Marg every day about saris and you know, architecture and tribal art and dance and whatever art forms that Marg uh, entertained to cover at that time, contemporary art. And um, in the process, of course, I met many, many, many institutions in India, from craft councils to universities to um, government officials. Uh, and it, it shaped my consciousness, I think, in a very different way than um, somebody who would have gone to um, graduate school here um, and then uh, uh, maybe gone on to a job in a gallery or straight into a university setting. Um, I also grew up in America for most of my adulthood till 29, so I had very little understanding except for the years I spent in a public sector company colony in Bhopal of what it meant to be in India after 1974, uh, 75. So um, being in, uh, I, I was in India for the time of Indira Gandhi's assassination and the changing of governments for three years. But by and large, I do not come from an arts family, no institutionals. There's no uncles who are, um, you know, or aunties who are parts of any kind of arts institution. So everything is sort of being learned, in a sense, from a very kind of basic level. Uh, and it's an it's a interesting experience because, though I never set out to imagine it that way, I think it, it gave me a, a tiny understanding of what it means to step in from the outside into India's art world. And, um, and it was, it was a, it's an illuminating experience which has informed how I conceive this project um, in profound ways. Um, I also um, teach quite a bit at different kinds of places. I teach tour guides about Humpy. I teach um, foreigners who come on a trips to India about things related to the arts. So this is an interesting position for me to come to this project from. Okay, so let me jump right into the discussion of uh, the exhibition. Uh, vernacular in the contemporary, vernacular comma in the contemporary, began as a conversation sometime in 2005. Um, and it took five years before the exhibition opened in 2010. Davy Art Foundation had just been conceived. Um, I had worked with Anupam on a design project because he also runs Anupam Poddar, who is the head of, uh, with his mother of the foundation. I'd worked with him on a design project for a charbag, which I'd restored in Rajasthan. So I knew him on a designer to designer kind of level. Uh, but this was the first time I'd really interacted with him as a scholar uh, or as a curator. And I had been recommended by a friend of mine who he had approached to say, hey, I want to do this exhibition on folk and tribal art. That's how he had used the word. And that those are the words that he had used. And she said, well, there's this friend of mine or somebody I know named Annapurna Garamella who I've worked with. And she has this big commitment to these art forms. So we started the conversation and the, the building was being designed and conceived and constructed. And of course, prior to vernacular in the contemporary, two other exhibitions had happened. It had opened with Diksha Nad's still moving image, which was this really very, very expansive uh, exhibition of uh, new media art in India, video art, films, uh, digital stuff, uh, primarily video though. Um, that was the opening exhibition at Devi Art Foundation. And uh, the next exhibition was um, Where in the World by the faculty of Jawaharlal Nehru University School of Arts and Aesthetics. And it was a very interesting exercise because the faculty and the students curated the collection and wrote about it and designed the installation and all those other. So in this avowedly contemporary art space, like hardcore contemporary art space comes this exhibition. Now, um, in the time that I have, which is, I'm going to have to go over the hour just a little bit, if that's OK. Um, I did not show all 60 artists to you. I picked like some key people from each um, 
from each of the categories that I've just shown here. So if you could just keep this in mind, I, am, I put each one of them on the section headers, but this gives you the total map. This is L. Radhakrishnan, and he is a bronze um, uh, caster, and he's from uh, Tamil Nadu, and he did this incredible work uh, carving this big images, you can see of, you can see the approximate size of all of them in display, all the 108 karanas, the, the positions that uh, a dancer such as Shiva would take. Um, and the first time in Indian history ever have all 108 karanas been done in bronze. Usually they're put on the walls as sculptures of a temple, but here he's taken uh, a text that he got from a, a mata in, in Tamil Nadu and taken all these images and translated them into bronzes. So what's most of us know Shiva Nataraja through this image, and maybe there's like one other image that when he's doing the Udvajanu, he's got one leg up in the air like this. This is what we know of this. But to suddenly see this many is remarkable. So now what constitutes its remarkableness? Of course, that somebody would sit down and do all 108 itself is remarkable. But actually, what's remarkable is the kind of political and uh, tra transformations this project is a witness to and which also promotes. Historically, why was this image made? This image was made by the Chola kings as a portable image to take out of the temple complex so that people who cannot enter the temple have access to this image. The only place it's ever been worshipped as the Mula Vigraha, you know, the uh, Achala, the unmoving or the... All the Garbhagrahas, the sanctums, have stone images in Tamil Nadu. They're unmoving. The only place where it, there is a moving image is, of course, at Chidambaram, because that's where Shiva is, Nataraja, right? And you have to worship him like this. And he's also worshipped as an ether linga there. So all these sort of things. Of the vernacular that in terms of content that you were proposing, maybe I didn't get something, because it was, it was um, the vernacular in the contemporary seemed to me was either the content of the material, current affairs, 9-11, what have you, uh, an alteration in traditional life practice, you know, art forms, in other words, some change, right? So something that was exactly as it was 500 years ago, by your definition, would not be vernacular in the contemporary. So in that sense, are we then stuck with a temporal notion? So it seems to me like not just the contemporary, but even the vernacular, how is your notion of the vernacular different except as you know, that which is the residual and that which remains once you no longer accept the notion of the modern, right? Let me, let me just do a little bit of art history. Um, maybe 1930s onwards, there have been various attempts to say there is one temporality. Let's put everybody in the same space. Different people initiated it. Marg was one example. If you think of the magazine itself and the world that it constructs as one space, these are all our heritages. Let's invest in them collectively. There is another uh, model that happened um, from, um, let's say, from Swaminath and onwards, where these are all occupying the contemporary, the same level. So therefore, they're all at the same time. Thank you so much for listening.